welcome to the Ashland branch of the Pamunkey Regional Library for our program, Water and You. What is the water cycle and why should you care? Uh, today, we are joined by Brian McGurk, a Virginia Master Naturalist, who's going to lead us through the program. So uh, enjoy and put your questions in the chat box. Thanks. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, folks, bear with me while I work on sharing my screen. Okay, how does that look? Everyone. Looks good to me. All right. Okay. Now it looks good to me. I had to do a couple window adjustments there. All right. So what I want to talk to you about today, and happy Earth Day, by the way, I want to talk to you about a very, very important part of Earth and how we connect to Earth. And that is the water cycle. My goal is to help you think about water and your relationship to the earth through the water cycle. And this is what we're going to do, what we're going to go over. I want to talk to you about where our water comes from. What do we do with it? Where does it go when we're done with it? And why do we care? Why does it matter? So. It, by the way, if anybody ever tells you that dihydrogen monoxide should be banned, they are um, yanking your chain. They're kidding you because that's what water is and is one of the most abundant uh, compounds on earth. You've probably seen this diagram on the left, the water cycle, which uh, I'll describe it very briefly. Water, most of the water on Earth is in the ocean. You can think of the oceans as the reservoir or bank of most of uh, the water on Earth. And a whole lot of water will evaporate off of the ocean. And then it gets moved around in the atmosphere as water vapor. And as it cools, it condenses and turns back into liquid water, falls to the ground, and various things then happen to it. Um, it uh, water flows downhill, of course. So water can uh, flow along the surface and end up going through streams, rivers, and back into the ocean. Um, it will also, um, some of it will seep into the ground and become groundwater. And a whole lot of it in most places will get evaporated or uh, used by plants as they pump water out of the soil to, uh, to make energy for themselves through the process of photosynthesis. Most of the water, as I said, on Earth, like about 97% of it at any one time is in the oceans. And only uh, about 2.5% of the water on Earth is fresh. And if you look at the middle block diagram there, of that two and a half percent of fresh water, most of that is either in the ice caps and glaciers on Earth or is stored below the water table in groundwater. So only about 1.2 percent is surface water or other fresh water, which may, for example, be in, uh, in lakes, for example. Okay, so of that 1.2 percent, most of that is lakes and uh, permafrost, water that's in the soil but frozen, and less than a percent of that is in rivers, and a couple percent swamps and marshes or soil moisture. Living things are less than a percent, and the atmosphere about three percent. Now, um, water spends a lot of time in the oceans. It can take about 4,000 years for a water molecule to spend its time in the ocean. That's been estimated as an average number before, for example, it gets evaporated. However, in the atmosphere, a typical water molecule will only spend a few weeks or less 
in the atmosphere before it condenses and falls. So you can think of the atmosphere as kind of the superhighway in the water cycle. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what happens to water when it falls to earth as precipitation. Um, you see in the upper right there, what happens to most water probably across the earth is that uh, like a summer thunderstorm, a bunch of it just dries right up and evaporates again. And uh, during this time of year and on through the summer, the plants are active and they are taking water through their uh, roots and carbon dioxide and they're pumping that water through their systems and through the process of photosynthesis, they're releasing oxygen into the air. So they are using a lot of water. And as things are, as trees and plants are budding out and popping up, this time of the year, they're really cranking up from their sort of dormancy during the winter. So in a natural system, if you look in the lower right picture of a forest, if you're in an area like Virginia, and kind of right now, I'm gonna start talking more and more about uh, us here in Virginia. So a water molecule is gonna get used by, uh, by a plant and sent back to the atmosphere, or some of it will be soaking into the soil gradually, uh, especially during rainstorms. More of it will be uh, forming rivulets and small streams and ending up there in, the, in a large river, such as the James River, for example. Now, people have an effect on that though. We still have a lot of natural transpiration going on and evaporation, but uh, humankind has also altered the landscape. So we are producing our own plants and we have a lot of evapotranspiration being going on while we're producing food for ourselves. We also have uh, things going on like uh, when we raise animals, we may have them in the, in the lower right here, you'll see the picture of cows in a stream. So I want you to think about the effect that might have on that water that is being pushed gradually down towards the river. We also divert water um, in our paved areas and through our developed areas. And so um, yet I would like you to think about what happens to that water? One thing that happens to it is in a lot of cases, the, um, the time that it takes water to end up in our rivers in many developed areas is sped up quite a bit. And as water is rushing through a particular area, like for example, that picture of a, a, a stream gutter, it's potentially picking up quite a few things along with it, isn't it? Um, and if you look at that picture right under the, the cartoon of the plant with the picture with a house on a hill, look closely at the driveway and you can see a wet area. And that is an example of water that has seeped into the ground and is then come back out. And that's a process called interflow. And that happens a lot in hilly areas um, after rains when you've got a lot of water in the soil and it then starts seeping out. That's water that has not gone down to the water table to become groundwater. But I'll start talking about groundwater here in a second, after we talk about things that we do with water. In case you didn't know, uh, we use water the most to generate electricity here in Virginia. And that's, a, that's common across our country. 78% um, approximately makes up the total reported water withdraw withdrawn in Virginia in 2019. And the second highest percentage would be for public supply. And then smaller amounts to manufacture things, to mine things like sand and gravel. And then a smaller amount for agriculture and irrigation. I say agriculture to include things like raising animals like uh, livestock, chicken, pigs, and cattle, and irrigation to irrigate crops. Now, I want to point out that this is reported water use. Virginia has a, um, a law that requires large water users to report 
every year their uh, withdrawals of water. And uh, we, the folks that keep track of this are pretty sure that the irrigation component of this pie chart is underrepresented, but we're also pretty confident that it's not underrepresented by more than several times. So uh, irrigation, while we have a lot of agriculture going on here in Virginia, is still a small part when you consider the water we use for power generation. Well, let me go back a second because I forgot something. I'm gonna go back. Hang on just a second. I wanted to point out that most of the water we use comes from surface water, comes from rivers. And most of that power generation is water that is pulled out of rivers for cooling. The largest power plants in Virginia, if you when you picture a power plant, a lot of times you'll you'll think of the the parabola of water cooling water towers like uh, yeah, Homer, Homer Simpson or something like that. Those are power plants that are recycling their cooling water. They may pull it out of a river, but they use less water than the larger power plants that just uh, run it once through. However, those larger power plants are returning the, the water right back to the river. It's warmer than it was, but it spends some time cooling off again after it's left the power plant and it goes right back to the river. That water use is called non-consumptive because it goes back to its source in a very relatively short time. The water that is going through those parabola-shaped cooling towers uh, is being evaporated after it's been reused several times, and that's called consumptive water use. Most of the other uh, uh, ways we use water is consumptive because we divert it somewhere. We, uh, you know, we divert it through our bodies, for example, and it goes, takes a different route back to the water body that it came from, or it may go back to a totally different water body. If, for example, your water came from a well somewhere, and then it goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And I'll talk a bit about that right now. Um, first, I wanted to talk about our footprint, our water footprints. Um, you know, various director uses, things we actually do with water in our in our homes is called uh, our direct water foot, footprint. And um, best estimates are on average, a person uses about 75 gallons a day of water in that way uh, in their household. Now, I don't have a picture here of lawn irrigation. If you are irrigating your lawn, uh, regularly during the spring and summer, then that 75 goes well up over 100 gallons per day. Now, we have a lot of indirect water footprints. I mentioned the use for electricity. So you turn on your light, in a sense, you're indirectly using water because it took a lot of water to, to make that kilowatt or whatever kilo, kilowatts you use to uh, run the lights in your house. If we go clockwise around these photographs, gasoline, uh, three to six gallons of water per gallon of gasoline used. I actually would have guessed that would be higher. Uh, the pint of beer is 37 gallons. That uh, cup of coffee, 66 gallons to produce that cup of coffee. 240 gallons per loaf of bread. And a whopping almost 800 gallons per pound of beef. Now, these, um, I'm talking about the commercial process that we use to get our beer and our coffee and our loaf of bread and our pound of beef. If you perhaps get your beef from your local farm down the road and that, that happy cow has grown up on and lived his entire life grass fed and the whole process of producing beef from that cow doesn't involve a lot of transportation, then the water used would be a lot less. But typically, the food you buy in the supermarket, for example, or coffee you get at the coffee shop, these are the numbers that uh, represent the amount of water that 
has been used to produce these things for you. So I encourage you to check your water footprint. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's a couple of slides that list web links you can go to. And one of them is a link to check your water footprint. And there's a lot, you can just Google that and you'll find uh, various uh, websites to do that. Uh, I'm gonna move now to how we move water. Water, to, you know, everyone knows water flows downhill. Water also flows down gradients when we make a pressure gradient. We move water by pumping it, by making machines that make a pressure gradient that move it perhaps uphill. For example, if you look at the uh, lower left picture there, the cross section, the blue represents a river and water will flow into a surface water intake by gravity and will flow into that vertical looking pipe. It's called a wet well. That pipe's got a big pump in it. This is a, this represents a public water supply, large scale surface water intake. So that big pump in that wet well pumps water into a, through a pumping station, sends it to a water treatment plant where that raw water out of a river is treated so it's clean enough for you to use and drink and it distributed to the various places. But what, how do they, how do they uh, produce that pressure to get it, say, up into your second or third story faucet? Well, you pump it up into a water tower and use that electri electricity, pump it up into a water tower, and then that's got a higher pressure than the lowest point in your house, which is at your faucet when you open it up, and therefore water will flow to the house or to the ball field there, for example. If you um, happen to use a residential well, as is shown in the, in the diagram on the right, and not a public water supply, you're doing something very similar. But I wanted to talk about groundwater for a second and what the water table is. There's a picture of the, be of the beach and dig a hole in the beach, you're gonna to get to a point where you can't dig anymore because it just keeps filling up with water. That is the water table. And everything below that, all of the sand below that is saturated with water. And that is the case as you go inland, although it will get deeper, everything below that's, that water surface uh, or the, the ground below that water surface is saturated with liquid and usually water. And uh, that represent below the water table, water table represents the zone of groundwater. Now, water groundwater can, as it flows ever so slowly through the ground, it can it can get to a point where it's got a higher pressure on it than the land surface does. Then it'll have a higher pressure than the water table. In those cases, if you poke a well down into the zone where it has a higher pressure you can get a flowing artesian well, where if you open it up, the well will flow just by itself. No pump is needed because the pressure down below is higher than it is at land surface. The well in that picture look like, looks like it uh, has seen better days. It looks like it's broken. And that is a problem in some areas of our country with old wells that just flow in waste water. But look again to the right here. And I wanted to just talk about a uh, residential well for a second. Again, you see the vertical pipe, that's your, that's your well. You have a submersible pump that is submersed down below the water table and using electricity, you're pumping that water up into a pressure tank that holds pressure and you're usually in a basement of your house so that when you ab up above, open up your faucet, the pressure in that pressure tank is higher and water comes out of your faucet. So where does your drinking water come from? Uh, I'd like you to think about that. And for those of you who are listening live, go ahead and if you want and put in the chat, tell us where your drinking water comes from. And I'm, going, I'm not gonna wait for you, for you to, uh, to respond. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but in Virginia, most of, as I think I said before earlier, most of the public supply water comes out of our rivers in Virginia. 
a large percentage, but not the majority, will come from public water supply wells. And that's a picture of a large public supply well pump in the middle there. A lot of people in Virginia, in rural areas and suburban areas, have their residential domestic well as well. Before I move on, I'm going to give you the answer because it's kind of a trick question. If you haven't realized it already, it's not really your drinking water. You're just passing it along. In fact, in Virginia, um, the water law in Virginia is set up so that uh, you don't own that water, for example, that you pump from your domestic well. You own the well, but groundwater resources are a resource of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And this, the Commonwealth recognizes that the importance of the folks that live in, in the state uh, managing our groundwater and surface water resources for the benefit of all of the beneficial uses of that water. And if you think about it, it's not, people have a lot of beneficial uses and so do other creatures in our state as well. Okay, where's water go when we're done with it? This diagram and the photo on the left are a, a, just a cartoon of our sewer systems. If you're in an urban area, suburban area, if you're on a sewer system, then wastewater that leaves your house is hooked up to a pipe, it flows by gravity, probably to a pumping station which pumps it into a wastewater treatment plant so that our wastewater is, is treated to a point that it's clean enough. Where, where do we do it? We put it back in the rivers in the, for the most part. Or if you are on a residential area where you're not in a sewer system, you likely have a septic tank. That's a picture there in the middle. Concrete tank where um, the wastewater from your household sits and settles. The solids go to the bottom and that gets pumped out every few years. The uh, liquids decant basically from a point, high, a point high in the septic system and flow by gravity, normally by gravity in some places it needs to be pumped into a drain field which is uh, an area of small pipes that are perforated that are laying atop a, a, a bed of sand and gravel. And the wastewater then that decants out of your septic system gradually flows out of that and it flows into the soil above the water table. And that layer of sand and gravel as well as the native soil below it is, uh, the idea is for the water to be treated that way so that by the time the, the water that infiltrates, some of it evaporates, but most of it will infiltrate and head towards the groundwater system, that it's cleaned enough to uh, be relatively clean. Now, there can be some interference issues with wells from a septic tank. Let's say your water, let's say your septic tank and your drain field are working perfectly well in cleaning that water. It's important to realize that um, depending on local conditions, when that water hits the water table, it is heading towards a pumping well. Uh, your neighbor's residential well, um, ideally not because usually the uh, Department of Health roles are to have all of those things separated enough so that is not an issue, but it potentially can be an issue. Um, a pumping well will lower the pressure in the groundwater a little bit. And when the pressure is lower, groundwater flows towards that point of lower pressure and that's called a cone of depression. So it is always possible that um, the water that discharges from your septic tank may be heading towards somebody's well more likely or not, it's heading towards a small stream. So why does it matter what we do with water? It's because we like to reuse it. In fact, we uh, 
commonly reuse all of our water. This is a, a hypothetical diagram here where the thick green line would represent a large river in Virginia. Most of the rivers in Virginia will flow from around the Blue Ridge, across the Piedmont, across the coastal plain, and head for Chesapeake Bay. So imagine this as, say, the James River. Um, the yellow circles are surface water intake, and the red uh, symbols are a wastewater discharge point. So you can see that um, it's quite likely that if your water is coming from one of these surface water intakes, it's receiving water uh, that used to be wastewater. It's receiving water that came out of a wastewater treatment plant, or perhaps if you think about it, also a lot of septic tanks. And so what we rely on is for those water treatment systems to work properly. And also, um, these the wastewater we put back, we discharge back into our stream systems is considered an important part of the quantity of water that we have in Virginia, especially during a drought. In some of the small rivers, the wastewater discharge during dry times is a significant percentage of the water in the river, and it's considered a resource in the river. And so we really rely on that infrastructure of treating our water to work properly. Again, why does it matter what we do with water? Well, um, uh, I want to point out in this slide the critters that rely on that water. The, uh, the bug on the top is a benthic, uh, a, a stream bottom organism called a benthic invertebrate. I think I don't, I'm not positive, I think that's a stonefly larva. And those little creatures are commonly used as sort of the canary in the coal mine. Streams are checked for their, uh, to see how healthy they are by looking for these guys, because a lot of them will not live in a stream that is polluted. Uh, water flea or an amph amphipod is on the upper right. They're ubiquitous in our clean waters, herring shad on the lower right, and our invertebrates down in the coastal plain in Chesapeake Bay uh, need fresh water, as well as uh, that's an, an Atlantic sturgeon, which are an endangered, threatened, and I think they're an endangered species that they live in the James River and other parts of the Chesapeake Bay. And all of the creatures other than us need to have water that is, you know, not too polluted. And also we play in water. We like to fish, catch fish. We like to eat fish from our streams. And uh, one issue that some rivers have had is an abundance of blue-green algae. And there's a concern about what is what is causing that. And it, it can affect our recreational use. Um, you know, historically, our, our, our state has a lot of point source discharges of pollution, and each of those point source discharges uh, are controlled and permitted so that the water that comes from those discharges is considered to not have enough pollution to uh, affect the stream, the stream that it's going into. It used to be not that case. And in the past couple of decades, we've kind of gotten our act together that uh, a, a, uh, an entity, a, a wastewater treatment system or an industrial process facility has to have that water treated before it's discharged. Something we're dealing with in the Commonwealth is combined sewer and stormwater systems. If you look in the upper right, I believe that's a, a pop-off. Uh, for a one of those combined systems where after a storm, it just couldn't handle it and water is coming out the top. You can see in the background in that picture that the road there is flooded. So it, it's important that we have our sewer and stormwater infrastructure taken care of so that it can handle the water that's being shoved through there, both naturally and from our uses. Uh, on the lower right, is a field with runoff water full of sediment. And as that water makes it to a stream, 
um, it will it can potentially clog a stream with sediment and too much sediment is not good for our surface waters, especially if it contains water that has been added to a field, for example, as fertilizer. And that also includes uh, um, residential lawns as well. Now, what, the, what, all, what happens on the downstream end of all of this? Um, you, uh, in the, uh, well, in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, here on this slide, the example is we have a problem with red tides. And that is a result of loads of nutrients entering uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Algae uh, will bloom because of that, because they're metabolizing that stuff. And then what happens to that is they cause an oxygen depletion zone because in their rampant bloom, they deplete all the oxygen for a particular zone. In this case, you might have heard of the dead zones uh, off the mouth of Chesapeake Bay in the Gulf of Mexico. It happens every year. So uh, I've got a list of do's and don'ts here. Basically, if you haven't figured out already, I'm coming to please don't pollute. But also the do's here, figure out your water footprint. So you kind of understand uh, we're using a lot of more water than we might think we are. One thing you can do around your house is to landscape to stop runoff that might carry things that you don't want to carry down into the, into the uh, our streams and rivers. And if you look at that photograph in the in the in the center, that's a ditch that uh, looks to me like it was intentionally planted as sort of a rain garden. You can catch runoff. Uh, with plants by basically not letting sediment laden and fertilizer laden water go all the way through the system into streams. Just let the plants have it. They will hold that stuff back. They'll use that water. And as they you know, like follow irrigate only when needed and minimize the fertilizing. I did not talk about microplastics and plastics, but that has become quite a problem uh, you might have heard of. Um, so the idea is just use less plastic and recycle what you do use. So we do not have uh, plastic going where it shouldn't be going. Use phosphate free detergent and you can shop to stop water pollution. By That goes right back to try to use less plastic. You can look for cleaners and uh, um, other materials that would uh, basically lower um, the amount of water that is leaving your property that is carrying uh, harmful things for the environment. I think I felt to mention that water is uh, considered the universal solvent because so many things dissolve in water and get carried right through and, uh, and some of them end up being harmful. Some of the things like microplastics, we don't know what the actual um, impact of that is on us and the environment. Um, water also, if even if it doesn't dissolve a pollutant, it can carry it along. And uh, think uh, water running through a street down the storm drain, um, it's carrying oil on top of it. So don't, don't wash oil spills or chemicals down any drain. Try not to use pesticides because if you overuse that pesticides, that's just uh, detrimental to the environment. And please don't litter. If it's out of sight, it is really not gone. It's just gone somewhere else. So that kind of ends my spiel. I hope that you have uh, gotten some ideas about your role in the water cycle. We're part of the water cycle. And it's important that we realize that we can have an impact on that. Um, water reuse is always being recycled. Um, that water molecule you drank in your glass of water a little bit ago has been around for a long, long time. It's not disappearing, it's going somewhere else. 
and might come back again. Okay, Master Naturalist program. I just wanted to mention um, that I'm a, a member of this program and it's a statewide core of community volunteers who provide education, outreach, service, and not also citizen, perform citizen science. And it's for the beneficial management of Virginia's natural resources. And uh, interested folks can become a master naturalist through training and subsequent volunteer service. And there's a website to learn more about that. So it's time for questions, if you have any. And I have two pages here of useful links that um, are sources to learn more about the water cycle and water use and conservation and water pollution. And I will go back one if someone wants to take a picture of this one. And then in a minute, I'll go to the next one. And that's what I've got, folks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Brian. That was wonderful. Uh, I hope our uh, guests got something out of this. And uh, we'll, we'll be posting this on our uh, website and our Facebook page uh, very shortly. And uh, you can come back and watch it again or ask your friends to come see it or let your friends know it's there. And uh, we ask you to keep an eye on the webpage for other interesting programs put out by the Pamunkey Regional Library. Um, we always have new and interesting things coming up and uh, they're there, there for your, your enjoyment. So we hope you enjoyed this and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Have a good day. Goodbye. Thank you.